This is Robert Clinkybeard and David Anderson with the Commercial Landscapers Podcast. We're going to take 20 minutes of your life to deliver some amazing business content from accomplished leaders to bring you value, scale your business, and better yourself personally. We hope you really enjoy the show and I encourage you to share with your network so they can subscribe and we can expand these messages globally. We are also super excited to be supported by two brilliant sponsors. If you're tired of measuring properties, site recon platform fully automates measurements so you can focus on sales. So think measurements, think site recon. The other sponsor is Company Cam, who make it dead simple to communicate, document, and problem solve with guys in the field, no matter where you are. Company Cam brings documentation, communication, and liability protection together in one simple, easy to use app for you and your entire team. Company Cam is the only app every landscaper needs. Check it out. Hi, this is Robert Clickerbeard with the Commercial Landscaper Podcast. I am really, really excited today to be joined by Mike Brewer. Mike, I think you joined me probably about a year and a half ago when we first started doing this and uh, obviously things have developed since then. So Mike Brewer, um, thank you for joining me today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So, Mike, just um, so everybody has a, a quick uh, background to who you are for our listeners, we have about well, four or 5,000 listeners now across the US, Europe, Asia. So uh, tell uh, a little bit of our audience about your background. Yeah, so i um, been in the plumbing trade right out of high school, um, worked for a neighbor of mine, actually, and he decided to retire about 11, 12 years into it, and that was basically 32 years ago. So I bought the company. It was me and one guy on a Monday and, and, uh, don't know if you want me to share with the most current situation or not, but, um, sure. If if you're able to. Sure. Yeah. So all that culminated over the last 32 years, we built a great business and actually just sold it all last Thursday as of last Thursday. Um, it's quite a, quite a year. We actually been in a conversation since mid January and, uh, but we were able to, you know, get it all done and, and put to rest. And so now, um, instead of being the guy at the top, I have a guy above me because I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> so, I mean, that's probably why I was quite keen on getting you on the podcast since it's so fresh. Um, I, I mean, how, how are you feeling? I mean, you, has it sunk in yet? Are you still sort of trying to wrap your, wrap your head? Yeah. <laughs> no, great, great question. Um, easy one to answer. No, it hasn't sunk in. I don't think, um, you know, you're so busy right at the end, especially just trying to get to the finish line. And, and I evidently, these things happen all the time, but being most of us are only going to do it once in our lifetime or career. Um, it was frustrating for me, but evidently talking with the attorneys that very seldom do they just close smoothly, especially the size that this transaction was. A um, little more background. So started Brewer Company, Brewer Enterprises in 1990, January of 1990. Um, the, you know, we've had our ups and downs, much like the market has. It's all new residential single family construction. Um, along the way, we added Benjamin Franklin Plumbing to it, service and repair, and that's a franchise business. Um, so for residential retail repair. And then we also, I bought into another little company a buddy of mine had, and we added drain cleaning and, and commercial service repair as well, as long, along with a little bit of new build on the commercial side, um, small projects. But um, but yeah, no, it, uh, you know, we grew that over time, over all those years. And again, with the ups and downs to be the largest plumbing contract in the state of Arizona, purely on revenue, um, number of homes, we built 7,000 last year. We'll build probably around 7,700 this year between Phoenix and Tucson. So a lot of moving parts. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, it, it, the beauty of it is, and I think it's, something that you know not to just step over is you know we all run a business we hope to one day have somebody make an offer to us that they want to purchase that and you can either do it by design or you can hope that that actually happens and what i mean by do it by design is build a business that someone else actually will pursue we did not reach out we had declared we're a legacy business about six years ago uh, my sons worked in the business and consequent to that, this past January, actually it was late last fall, had first contact, but we actually sat down and, and had a serious conversation beginning in January. And the beauty of that is they were pursuing me. I wasn't throwing a for sale sign on the building. And uh, 
So the nice part is obviously you're always in the driver's seat when someone's pursuing you versus you're trying to sell something. You know, this, yeah, and that's great. I mean, I could go so many different directions right now, but <laughs> you, you, you touched on it. And I want to just, uh, I suppose, show people how, how much of a change this is because, you know, I think back in, you know, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, back in that 2007, 2008 wow. range, when the whole recession hit, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you're obviously doing new build construction, which is the worst market to be in at that time. And talk, talk, talk through that uh, stage. In your yeah, um, brutal time. Um, that was the last downturn that I will ever actually be at the helm for um, since we sold. But yeah, seven, actually six and seven, this thing slowed down. We were a fairly, we were a mid-sized company, um, four or 5% of the marketplace in the Phoenix market only. As we rode through there, um, you know, it was really about survival. And we just did everything we could to earn a dollar, try to cover our overheads, just make it out the other side. And as we did that, we started, you know, putting strategies together about, you know, just minimal cost. And, and basically, we went and got a dollar anywhere we could get a dollar. Um, today, we don't do any custom home building at all. Um, at that time frame, we did it. We worked anywhere we could work. And again, just to literally scratch out a dollar to try to make it to the next week. Um, along the way there, the opportunity that provided us, you know, people became available. So when we were a smaller player, it's much like the current marketplace. There was nobody available. You couldn't hire anybody. You couldn't hire anybody that actually, you know, knew what they were doing. And so consequence of that, we just stayed a small company. And as it slowed down, we actually kind of took advantage of that, not really understanding the gravity of the situation that was in front of us. That was in the spring of 2008. We made a conscious decision to grow, go take market share. There was employees available. Some of the big boys had shut down through 2006, 2007. So there was not a glut of labor, but there were definitely labor available. And so we were in that mindset. And then October of 2008 happened and, you know, I guess to kind of talk about numbers and what I remember off the top of my head, I know in August we did, it was 265 starts that month in August of 2008. February, January, February of 2009, we started 19 houses. So the market completely went away. Um, again, that's why we were scratching and clawing. You know, currently it's, it's tailed off a little bit. You know, the end of the year is typically slower than the spring. Um, but this year, earlier this spring, we were doing 160 starts a week. And, um, you know, it, it really was, you know, in hindsight, you look back and you say, man, you know, how did we survive that, uh, you know, 19 for a whole month and we're doing 160 a week. And uh, so, again, we have good people. And then we, I think really where it started is probably about five, six years ago, is really starting intentionally change the structure of the leadership team. And with that, added some additional processes that I know you're really familiar with. The one that you know we happened to go with was EOS. Um, but I think the leadership is what really was critically important. Um, and the interesting part of it was we didn't change anybody. We just changed, I guess, what their focus was. Um, you know, I mentioned we had three different operational entities. Each one of those had a president, and they were kind of in a silo. They didn't really talk to one another. You know, the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. And so in this September 2016, um, we did what we call a retreat the first time. It, it since has become a summit. Um, but we went up and kind of declared some new intentions. So we had a, you know, intentional, we looked ahead and said, hey, a five-year plan. And this is pre-EOS. Um, you know, where do we want to be in, in 2020 and 2021? And and when we did that, it really became apparent that we couldn't do it in the current configuration that we found ourselves in. And you know, with, with individuals in silos, not understanding what the others are doing. And so we reconstituted our leadership team. And as we did that, um, basically we all became a one team that overarching leadership over all the entities. And so one guy was responsible for, let's say sales, another was, responsible for operations in the field. 
We had another gentleman that was responsible for all operational support. So all the internal operations that support the field. And then we had, of course, our, our CFO, which was responsible for human capital and um, you know financial capital and, and all the banking side of things and insurances. And so, I sat kind of in the middle as a CEO. So, so talk through that in a bit more depth because, you know, hearing out from you, I mean, that's obviously a huge fundamental shift, but that's not going to happen overnight. You know, right. You about mindset. You talked about, you know, going from just, you know, coming out of survival, you know, probably just making a little bit of profit now to where you are now. I mean, that's, that's a huge change. So how did you start that process? How did you get their buy-in? Um, let's start. Sure. Let's well, so we weren't making a little bit of profit. We were frankly losing our ass, but we were surviving. And that was, a, my CFO was excellent at kind of making phone calls, letting people know. So communicating to the vendors that, you know, when they were going to get paid, if they weren't going to get paid on time. So it's critically important is communication, obviously, as it is in any business. But I think the shift really that took place was the alignment of the team. Um, you know, as we sat around at this first summit and said, hey, we have all these big aspirations, you know, how are we going to attain that? We've always wanted to do well. Um, what, why is this any different this time? And I think what it really came down to um, was, you know, everybody truly buying in and, and, you know, being all aligned. And to do that meant that from my perspective as the ownership was that we needed to be not just talk about being all in, we needed to like exhibit, you know, I guess action around being all in. And so for me, it was, you know, my leadership team, various different ages of kids and, and different space or different places in their lives. And so we went around the circle kind of, and I just asked the question. So if we're going to be all in, and that means you're always available to work, like you don't have to run home to take care of the kids because, you know, your wife has to go to work. Um, what would that look like? How much would that cost? And so everybody kind of threw their numbers out there and, you know, they were pretty varied, frankly, because of different places in life people were. And so, you know, I sat back, thought about it a little bit and, you know, it was a big, because what I had in mind and, and the commitment I was going to make back to them in order to get their commitment was a huge burden financially to the business. But I, without throwing numbers out, I went probably... I guess it's about $20,000 more than the highest guy's number. And when I did that, I said, we're all going to make the same income, including myself. We're all in this together. And this is about, you know, one for all and all for one. And so that was the first move I made. And then right behind that, when, you know, we kind of talked about that a little bit and I said, but better than that or bigger than that, because a salary is a salary. Great. Got a good salary. But how did they really buy in? And the buy-in came from the next offer I made, which was, it, you know, at this particular level, my executives were, you know, I was going to have them participate as though their ownership in the profits of the company. Now, I'm not a big fan of giving out any stock, phantom stock, real stock, whatever you want to call it. That just creates problems when you go to do a transaction, from my perspective. Again, just my opinion. And so I didn't want to do that. I also didn't want to have them put their homes on the line in case something went south. I held the risk. I held the lion's share of the company regardless. Um, so there's four other gentlemen and myself. So effectively, you know, I was giving up basically 20% of the business. They all got 5% of profits. And it was amazing, you know, as we talked about that, of course, they really appreciated that. Um, then it went to... Um, you know, with all these big numbers we were talking about doing. And, you know, once we started really kind of working through, we realized that, gosh, we need more help. Um, and so we think about that a little bit differently, maybe than most people do, but good help is critically important to success, being successful. And we had a lot of other people at the next level down below us, um, like a controller, like an HR person, like, a, uh, I guess, an area manager, some a, several area managers out in the field, running the field, uh, their boss, and they all had various titles. And so we said, well, we need a commonality with them and so that they can all be a team as well. And so we dubbed them all directors. So all their titles changed to director of whatever domain they happen to reside in. So director of HR, director of finance, director of um, you know different pieces, a director of the operations. And so we brought them in and they also got 
tied to the bottom line. And so basically another point each there. And um, so over the years, people have, you know, I've shared this with, and this is obviously the most public place I've ever done it. Um, but I've had a lot of people over the years say, man, are you crazy? You're giving up 30% right off the top. And I, you know, all I can tell them is, let me share the numbers with you. And, you know, we went from a large company, uh, you know, it was a, let's say mid $30 million operation, not producing much bottom line or very little thin margin on that. And this is after the downturn. This is just five years ago. So, you know, it was 2016 um, is when we changed it up. And we went from that to um, more than double top line and probably just under quadrupling the bottom line. And so when you think about that, it's like I can give up that 30% of nothing and have a, you know, what we're doing and producing today um, was a very valuable company. And again, along the way, part of that was building process and building systems. And so I, I guess it's just kind of bifurcate is how do I get the leadership on board? We aligned our intentions and we did it in a very specific manner. And so, you know, when it used to be if something got broke, something walked out the back door, that was Mike's money. Um, all of a sudden it became their money. And it was amazing, absolutely amazing how fast that mindset shifted the entire business. Wow. Because now all of a sudden they were tied to the bottom line. And that and, happened at different levels within the company because you had their buy-in. Yep. Yep. And that, that was what was critically important. We can want to do well all we want at the top, but without that next layer of people being bought in as well, um, you know, it's a struggle. It would have been a struggle. And so we launched in 2017 under our own, as I described it, you know, somebody in charge of each operation, sales and, and finance. And it was a disaster, frankly. Um, we had a whole bunch of people targeting, trying to get better, trying to do better, trying to clean messes up. And as I watched month after month, we weren't making any money. In fact, we were going backwards and pretty hard to have people that are tied to the bottom line, see there is no bottom line to think it's worth anything but just a bunch of conversation. Right. And we actually took for the first probably nine or 10 weeks of the year every Tuesday morning and, and sat with that director level. So all 15 of us in a room and taught them financials, taught them balance sheet, taught them income statement thinking, um, work in process, how it all works. So when you twist one knob over here, how it affects something over here. And, but it wasn't really showing up at the end of the month. And so in June, June, July of that year, I picked up the book Traction. I happen to have it on the bookshelf. Um, so I'm an EO member and I think I got it through that organization, but I never had read it. Right. And so I happened to be going out doing something vacation or something. I took the book with me and I read through it. It's like, my gosh, this is just, we're already doing a bunch of this, but there's a whole bunch we're not doing. And the biggest challenge that I had that I felt that we had as a company was our culture. Um, we've grown to, you know, nearly at that time, I think around 300 employees, um, and the problem with that is, you know, when I'm a 30 man shop, 50 man shop, even people knew who I was, they knew what I stood for, they knew what I expected. But at 300, 300, whatever, 300 plus, most of them didn't know who I was. And they didn't know what I stood for. They didn't know what I expected. There's just whatever their boss told them. And, and you know, there's a lot of moving parts when you're that size company and building that many homes. So we really, that was a huge component of the EOS system um, that I really was looking forward to. But the other side of it, or the other part of it is just the accountability. And again, you and I've talked a little bit about that. You know, I chose EOS. I mean, I'm, I believe there's people that are just, it's either their program or nobody's else is worth having. I'm not that. I think it, from my perspective, and again, I think we even talked about this the first time I was on the show, um, was that pick one. I don't care if it's traction. I don't care if it's, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. game of business. Yeah. Game. Any of them. I mean, there's four or five of them out there, but if you're going to do it, do it, you got to commit to it. You got to go all in. And I think that's the real key to any of the business processes because, you know, most of us, let's just put it the way it is. Most of us, especially subcontractors, you know, how do we end up there? 
uh, either we worked for somebody that was a small business and they retired. Your uncle used to have a company and he retired. Or you got pissed off one day and said, I can do a better job of this than they can do it. And so I'm going to go compete with them. And somehow you managed to get by and get far enough along that you actually are competing with them. But we're not typically process oriented people. We're just really good operators. And to really be a great company, I believe, is you got to have process. You've got to have open thinking. You've got to be looking into the future. You got to be solving problems be before they become problems. Yeah. And when you do all that, you become very different than the competition. And I'm no better than anybody else, but somewhere along the way, we just figured out that, hey, we want to be professionals over here. And so we just acted different. And with that, I think it's all a part of, you know, being open to new ideas, to processes, to an EOS type system. Um, you know, and, and then once we got kind of exposed to it, just really embracing it. And again, it goes back to the culture that we did when we first started with EOS. We changed up our culture and we re, you know, went through the whole system and, and said, okay, what do we stand for? And then we publicized that and we really, really drove it home into everyone in the company. And it wasn't just me coming out, you know, I guess coming in from a weekend out with some business consultants saying, hey, here's our core values. Everybody has to now operate this way. It was our team put those together. Yeah. And so they had buy-in from the get-go. So I think that's a critically important piece that a lot of people miss as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm hearing so many nuggets here that uh, you're giving our listeners. I'm hearing, uh, you know, getting that you know, leadership team in place, you're getting that complete alignment, bringing in some type of a system, U.S. scaling up, and then, you know, building in those um, processes, that accountability piece. And then obviously, while you're doing all that, then you're really enhancing the culture in the company. You're really yeah. making sure that people are buying in. You're doing events. You're doing fun stuff to bring in that culture. And, you know, I think part of that, a lot. I hear a lot of companies complaining about, you know, lack of employees. And, yeah, I know, I know there's definitely an issue out there. But I think for me, if I'm a firm believer. If you have that right company and the right company culture, then that typically attracts labor you get referrals coming in so i'm sure that came into play as well during your whole growth yeah you know it did um we developed some of our own labor and and that that's a really expensive way to go the nice part of it is they only know how to do it the way you taught them to do it so that's that's a plus for that but there is we've had other people again it goes back to i think once you get known as a very people know what to expect our customers know what to expect, so we have more work than we can manage. And the people that work for us know what to expect and how we interact with them. And that, you know, so the know it, live it, love it behind me here, I mean, those are our, our fundamental core values, but under each of those four bullet points. And so it's really, you know, talking about, you know, who are we with a culture? And once people word got out kind of what that culture is, um, we were just a different business. I mean, we've been around 32 years. People know us for a long, long time. Um, I say that and then proud to, you know, say that we got that far. Um, but I don't think it needed to take 32 years, frankly. I mean, you know, you learn as you go. It's part of the, unfortunately, it's part of the gig, how it goes. Um, and it's one of the reasons why, you know, I agree to be on these kinds of, you know, podcasts and things is that part of my ambition, what I call my ambition is to give back. And, uh, you know, I'm 61, um, kind of towards the tail end of my career. Like I said, you know, sold all our businesses. I'm good to go, um, but I don't want to go anywhere. I want to be around. I want to be involved with the business. The configuration that we're going to be in now is with several other trade, um, basically trade distinctions, I'll call them, but so concrete framing, electricians, HVAC, coming together in what's been dubbed in the past as a super trade. And I think that a lot of people call things super trades that aren't really, they don't really operate that well. And so I'm super excited where I had a legacy business um, prior to last week. I'm excited about being a part of a new legacy business that we're able to take and really do it right, put people together, take a lot of costs out of the building of homes that everybody benefits from. You know, the buyer benefits, the builder benefits, and the, all the trade contractors involved with the benefit. And, you know, so when we, when you have a steady stream of work that people trust is going to be there for them, then they're more willing to stay around once they do come on board. 
Um, you know, we're not perfect. We have turnover just like anybody else, but I don't think it's as bad. I think once they're here and they're here for, if we can get them to be here for a month, two months for sure, we've got a huge success rate with keeping them on board. So we've grown the company um, well over 32 years. Me and one guy started it. Um, jumping back to 2016, going into 2017, we were just under 300 employees actually. And when we, as of last week, I think we had 412 employees. So you know, some of those we built, a lot of those we attracted. And, you know, as you might imagine, there's just a lot of moving parts. I've been blessed. I've got a great team, a great structure. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And it's, we couldn't do 7,500 houses without process. It's that simple. No, that's great. And I'm sure your, you know, your leadership team, your middle managers are probably seeing some real great opportunities out of who you're now partnering with, the fact that you're partnering with other trades. I mean, that, that must be exciting for them as well, because knowing you, Mike, I mean, you you will only partner with somebody who will allow opportunities for your team and a really good core company. So, um, yeah, I, I, in fact, that's like even my sons, right? They, they work in the business. I mean, they had an expectation that one day they would take it over and run it. Well, they're 30 years old and this is a monster. It's not just a little, you know, 10 man operation that's easy to run. Um, so they were at least probably 10 years from an opportunity there and maybe even 15. Um, but, you know, I think that the opportunities that exist are there's gonna be new roles that just don't exist in a single contractor, like a trade like myself. Um, you know, it was, we even talked about it with the employees as we shared the news with them is that, you know, there's, we're kind of a flat organization. I mean, compared to a lot of our peer groups out there, our competitors, if you will, they say, oh man, you guys are so top heavy and you're stacked, you got a lot of employees. Well, when you got that many employees, it's required. But relative to the employee count, I think that, you know, our cost per overhead, you know, component is probably lower than most because we're doing so many units there. But now that we're in this new configuration, there's all of a sudden a whole lot of things open up because not only are we not, I mean, the ambition is not just to be in Phoenix and Tucson. Um, you know, one of the companies that they already own is up in, they're in Nevada already, they're in color or in California. Um, you know, we have an ambition to be in Utah, Colorado, Texas, um, pretty much a regional, you know, player is where this thing's headed. And as we do that, there's going to be opportunities for people to move up and grow and a lot of new leadership roles that don't exist today. So that was a big part, you know, when we, um, and I, I don't know if I've said the term I yet, maybe I have, but I think I use we a lot. And when I say we, it's my team and I, um, I couldn't do this by myself. It takes a team to be able to be who we are and as good as we are. And I think that we've got recognition. In fact, um, really proud to tell the story. There's a national, one of the top three national builders in the country. Uh, before I actually hired my investment banker, she's off the East Coast, um, but she shared with me after I'd hired her, she said, yeah, you know, I was an event six, eight months ago. And uh, before, so it would have been last year in 2020. And she was talking to this particular, he was a COO, the chief operating officer for this national organization, national COO. And she asked him a question, he's like, who's your best trade contractor in the country? And without hesitation, he said, it's Brewer. It's this little plumbing contractor out in Arizona. I don't know if he said little, that just kind of comes to mind, but, um, but without even hesitating. And so, you know, when I get third party feedback like that, um, you know, we just think that we're really good at what we do and we're right here in Phoenix and Tucson, but when you're nationally recognized and you don't even know it, yeah. um, that's an accomplishment. That's, that's awesome. So Mike, as we finish up here, you know, you've got you know, a bunch of listeners still fighting the fight every single day. They're trying to get, you know, working on the business and what, what would be your one or two big takeaways just to sort of leave them with uh, as they trying to, trying to figure out to do a similar exit like you have? Yeah, well, first off, I hope every single person on here can do that someday. Um, took me a long time to get here and, and it, it's a culmination of a lifelong career. But I think the, the number one thing is probably um, trust, you know, like get good people around you and then align yourselves 
and then give them autonomy to operate. You know, it, that's the biggest thing. You know, it's just human impossibility to be more than one place at one time. And if I'm not going to, if I'm going to hire somebody and then try to manage them very closely, every move they make, what's the point? And so, you know, from my perspective, it's get good people, get to know one another. I mean, so that you can build that trust. And once you have trust, let them operate. They will not do it. I categorically will guarantee you they will not do it the way you're going to do it. Maybe sometimes, but for the most part, they probably will do it different than you think it should be done. But more often than not, what I found was, wow, never would have thought to do it that way, but gee, what a great outcome. And probably it was better than the way I would have done it. And so I think the, the key part of that is once you start getting that, once they start doing that, you can build more trust. It becomes much easier to offload more and more of those day-to-day -day things that actually stop us from actually growing as a business. And so, you know, it, the cliche is, you know, work on the business, not in the business. Um, that is so true. It's not just a cliche to actually be a company that someone would pursue and want to write a check for. You better have a team. I'll put it this way, right in the midst of this entire thing, right in the middle of due diligence, I left in late August, like August 25th, I left town. Between August 25th and September 28th, I think I was in town for four work days, four business days. Um, just had several different things going on. And then I was out doing what I love to do, which is run around the woods chasing animals in September. But it's not even an argument. It's categorical. The biggest deal ever in my entire life, I walked away for five weeks, and didn't make a single phone call the whole time I was gone. And my team ran point on the due diligence, wow. getting things that's done. So that's, you know, it's a huge, huge part of it. I mean, to have a team you can trust allows you to do big picture things that actually add value to the organization that you're trying to build. And so that, that's one, that's probably the key one for me trust the people that are around you. If you can't trust them explicitly, then make a hard decision if you have to. Um, you know, for a long time, you know, let's just put it this way. The team that we finished with is not the team I started with, not even five years ago. Right. So, you know, it's, it's most of these systems, the uh, scaling up, the EOS, the, you know, Rockefeller habits, they've all got these components that sometimes you got to make a hard decision. And, you know, whether it's somebody... You know, it doesn't mean you don't love the person. It doesn't mean you have to fire them. It just means maybe they're not in the right seat. And, you know, when you put them in the right seat, man, they blossom. Right. And then you can fill the seat with somebody that really is the right person for the seat. That's awesome. that's so that's great. another huge component of it, I think, that really, really, it's, it's tough. Hard decisions are tough. People you love, been with you a long time. But I'll tell you, it was absolutely holding us back. And we had to, you know, and it was no fault of their own. It, it, they just had some challenges in their personal life. And that even makes it tougher because, you know, you've got to make a hard decision. But yeah. but in the end of the day, I think they would agree that they're in a much better situation and much better place in life today because of it. That's awesome. And awesome. They're still working here. They're just not in the same role they were in. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. That's a great message. So, Mike, uh, if people want to get hold of you, find out, just, you know, hear your story, just, you know, just pick your brain a little bit. What's the best way for them to? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm pretty open about it. Um, my email address is mike.brewer at brewercompanies.com. And it's all spelled out, no abbreviations. And that's probably the easiest way to get me. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. I have actually thrown out my cell phone number before and with all the things I've got going on, it's like, I hate not being able to get back to somebody. And, you know, the problem with text messaging and when that happens, all of a sudden you open up, you read it and I can't resave it as new on my phone. So it's like, sometimes I lost some of those and I run across them, you know, months later and I feel terrible about it. But so it's easier for me to, you know, just, just work it. And actually if they'll put in Iron Man, you know, as the subject line, then I know where they're coming from. And, and, you know, I can orient to that and, make sure I have the time to actually engage with them, but I'm open to it. You heard me say it earlier. I'm all about helping other business owners, frankly, not step in some of the, you know, the holes that I stepped in along the way. Cause every time you step in a hole, it seems to cost money. Right. So, <laughs> you know, true. you can learn from something that I've done. Um, love to share that with you and anything I can do to help you. I'm, I'm 
would love to be able to do that. Now you said four or five thousand people watching this. Hopefully, there won't be on you know, two two thousand of them call. But if they do, then we'll put together a whole big show. We'll put them all on one screen, and we'll have one big yeah, very, uh, maybe we could always do a, do, a, do a webinar or something. But yeah, very very compelling story. So Mike, uh, really appreciate your time today. I know we did it last minute, but uh, yeah, just wanted to get it well. It was raw from your deal last week. Yeah. So, uh, thank you again, Mike. Really appreciate you. Well, have a great Thanksgiving and everybody out there have a great Thanksgiving. There's much to be thankful for this year. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Robert. Congratulations. All right. Thank you. Talk soon. Okay, thanks. Bye. Hopefully that was pure dead brilliant for you today. And we've got some great takeaways for your business and your personal life. This is Robert Clinkenbeard along with David Anderson. And we'd love to get you and your friends to join us on our journey. Two quick things before you go, listeners. Check out our website, thecommerciallandscaper.com. You can subscribe, you can share with your friends. But more importantly, check out our sponsors. We have Site Recon, who are going to help to capture measurements on your property and create a really streamlined process. And we have Company Cam, who make it dead simple to communicate document and problem solve with guys in the field no matter where you are thanks everyone cheers